Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tanya Verhulp, and I am the Director of Executive Education here at the Haskins School of Business. Thank you for joining us today for the next session as part of our series, Haskin Connects. Thank you to everyone who had a chance to join us for the last five sessions, and welcome to everyone who's joining us for the first time. Haskin Connects was created to help you navigate through these uncertain times with quick tips and ideas to move forward. We're hosting these sessions every week on a variety of topics, so continue to watch for upcoming invitations. All previous sessions have been recorded and are posted on our website if you're interested in taking a look. A quick note that we ask that you hold your questions until the end. We have left plenty of time to take as many as we can. I would now like to welcome Beth Reimer Heck, who will be moderating our session today. Well, thank you, Tani. Great to be moderating this session with Dr. Scott Rafford, our expert in the marketing field. Scott, your topic today is post-viral marketing. Are you digital marketing ready? So my first question to you is, what do you mean by post-viral marketing? Uh, thanks, Beth. Um, I think uh, as, as we thought about doing these sessions, uh, really eight weeks ago this started, I think this would have been a really different session uh, than it is today. At that time, I think we would have been talking about contingency plans and marketing in a crisis. However, I think now is the time for us to start looking at a post-COVID world. Uh, what we're seeing is according to research by uh, Global Web Index, we're seeing that consumer sentiment has started to shift from acute concern about the virus to more transitory concern of the virus. Hopefully, at some point, we'll, we'll end up with normal, um, but we don't know what that new normal will look like or when normal will come. But so as we move through this transitory phase, I think we need to start looking forward. We need to start thinking about how we're going to emerge from the current situation we're in. But I think it's also an opportunity to look back and identify what can be learned from consumer behaviors and from business responses during the lockdown. Well, that's certainly, we've seen some really enormous shifts, like you say, in consumer behaviors. Uh, there would be very few, few people who would say that their consumer habits haven't changed. I know I've seen my changed far far more of an online presence. And I think even in uh, anyone else, they would say the same about that has affected us to become more online. I, you know, I, for instance, I'm doing groceries, et cetera, online. And so what I would ask you is, how would you describe this shift or transition in the market? Yeah, I think, I, I think we could really think of this as a strategic inflection point. We've got a, a, this is a change in the marketplace when we start seeing um, changes and alterations to the taken for granted assumptions underlying a business model. A lot of times these can feel sudden, but in reality, these tend to build up slowly over time. Um, Andy Grove, who coined the term, said that this referred to a change that was 10 times more significant than a typical change encountered by businesses. So I think inflection points offer amazing opportunities for companies to realize value, um, those companies that are ready to react, and they offer massive roadblocks to those who aren't ready to respond. Um, I thought it was interesting that in January of 2010, Fortune Magazine, perhaps somewhat prophetically, uh, talked about inflection points uh, in, in a recent article, and obviously they were maybe knew something coming, uh, and they talked about these three ways that firms react to inflection points. And that's what I sort of highlighted on this slide here. You know, the first group of people, they'll miss it entirely. They don't know it's coming. And I think seeing the number of traditional brick and mortar stores that have been shuttered because they haven't responded well to digital changes are an example of people that have missed those inflection points that we're in. Second groups tend to sort of catch the wave late. Some react well and others don't. Um, Adobe could be a great example of that where they were much later than a lot of other companies coming to the game with a subscription model, but they've actually done it very successfully. And now if you get uh, Photoshop and things like that, you buy it through a subscription model instead of buying the box software. But I think the most effective companies are those that over time, they've placed a lot of small bets. They try little things, they adapt, they adjust, and they see those changes coming. And that when shifts happen, they're much better uh, positioned to react to those changes. So it's a little bit like you're driving your car. If you're making small adjustments to steering to see what's coming in the road, you're better, uh, you're better positioned if a giant roadblock comes, you can deal with that much quicker. So I think these are the companies that we're looking at now. 
Well, this really resonates, uh, this response of by companies to strategic inflection points really resonates with me, and I'm sure it does with the audience too. We just need to be reminded about other historic strategic inflection points and those companies who missed it, like I'm thinking about uh, Kodak and Blockbuster. So uh, what do you think characterizes this particular inflection point and is this inflection point for, is this an inflection point for digital marketing? Well, and I think that's, that's a great question. And that, that was what I thought about when we were talking about doing this session is that how does, how do marketers respond to this inflection that's happening? And I think what we've seen more than anything is, is a strong rise of digital, right? Um, we've seen uh, Zoom, for example, has had like a 2000% increase in the number of people on Zoom. So people are actively using digital properties. And the question is, what are the implications for marketers in this space? Now, most of the digital properties have been around for years, right? Um, we've been had Facebook and email and web, but if we look back in the 90s, everybody felt they had to have a website, but they didn't always tie it into their strategy. In the 2000s, everybody said, you know, we need email marketing, but what we ended up with was spam and people really didn't tie it into their marketing. And in 2010 onward, we've seen social media really rising. And so those tools are out there. But this, I think, is the second reason why I thought of this title as post-viral marketing. Because a lot of times people have said, we need a digital marketing strategy, which means we've got to come up with a viral video or a viral ad, or we want it to go viral. And I think if we do that, we're not thinking strategically, we're thinking tactically. And I think this is an opportunity for us to really think about how those digital properties tie in to what we're trying to accomplish with our strategy. Our knowledge and sophistication in digital is much stronger than it was even five years ago. Data-driven insights are taking more prevalence um, in digital marketing strategy. It's not just about launching a website, a web page. Instead, how do we use the data that's available to us to make informed decision about what's working? So ultimately, I think it's not just about doing digital, because a lot of people are doing digital. The question is, are we doing digital well? So your contention is that one of the results of COVID is that it is an inflection point, as you call it, for digital marketing. So do you have any um, insights or behaviors that support your contention that digital is going to have a greater importance as we go through? Well, all I have to do is look at my, at my, uh, my parents on Zoom and having Zoom meetings with their kids, right? There's <laughs> a lot of people that have been moving into these spaces that they weren't moving into before. Um, this, was, uh, this was shared in a Facebook uh, briefing uh, to a number of, uh, of their digital uh, advertisers, people that worked with them. And what Facebook noted was an, an immense rise in not just younger generations, but everybody using social media. So in the last few months, what we've seen is 15% of boomers that had no presence in social media now had a presence in social media. So 15% rise in boomers using social media. 30% rise in millennials using it, 29% of Gen X, 27% of Gen Z. So this across the board, we're seeing more people that are moving online to do things that they didn't do online before. And they're becoming more comfortable with those properties. They're recognizing that they can have experiences that they once had face to face, they're now moving them online. And I think recognizing that these change of behaviors are across the board. Sometimes the term digital natives has been used to talk about millennials and Gen Z. You know, these are the people that grew up with email and the web and they're comfortable in that space. But even in that group, we saw a rise of use of these properties and we saw a rise in other, mar in other demographics as well. So I think, I think there's definitely an increase in the activities going on online and the types of activities. But I think for marketers, we also need to be aware that there's been some pretty compelling um, evidence of changes in purchasing behavior. So um, this is according to Marsis um, and looking at their uh, data on hundreds of millions of transactions online. And they found that 46% of people who made a purchase online in March were first time online buyers. So these are people that have maybe searched online, maybe used social media properties, but they've never pulled the trigger on actually ordering something online. They still went into the store. 46% of people who made purchases were first time buyers. And what the other interesting thing is, is that what does this do for brands? Because people didn't necessarily stay loyal. 
if I couldn't find my favorite brand of toilet paper, which was probably the case for many people, people were willing to go to another brand. They were willing to go to the product that would suit their needs and lost some of their brand loyalty. So we actually said, found that 40% of online purchasers in April were new purchases to that particular brand. So these are staggering numbers in terms of changes in the purchase behavior. And what we need to look at is how is this going to change? What is sort of the new normal? Are all of these people going to continue to purchase online? And what we're seeing in some of the evidence is that there's been a major increase in online purchasing, but in countries that are a little bit further ahead of us, countries like Australia, we're starting to see a bit of a dip in those online purchases, but it's still leveling out at a, le at a level higher than it was before the virus. So it's pretty interesting to me that, you know, how in two and a half months that the norm is is consumers are making purchases online and, you know, whether that food delivery or flowers or, you know, grocery stores or even, you know, arranging digital parties. Not that I did that, but because uh, I'm a boomer, as you call me. Um, obviously, uh, COVID has pushed that, right, as a factor because of the fact that there was a requirement so for social isolation. But as we're moving through that social isolation, that's coming up off. You know, what are some of the strategies and tactics that marketers can use to make sure they take advantage now of the fact that digital space is more important to consumers? And, and that's exactly what I wanted to get into with this talk. As, as I sat back and thought about what are, what are some pieces that we can learn, all three of these things are things that are good lessons for digital marketing, irrespective, irrespective of the COVID and being working from home. But I think what happens is we can learn from these digital marketing approaches as we move out of it. As the importance of digital rises, firms need to think about this. So I thought about three things that I wanted to share today. The first is that I think brands that have been more successful have focused less on selling and more on brand building. Um, how brands have in incorporated a good content marketing strategy has also been successful. And finally, thinking about how you're going to personalize your message in the digital space is really critical. So I thought it's, so for the first one, I think what we've seen is some of the most successful brands in the last eight weeks have realized that they need to work on a different part of the sales funnel. You know, this is relevant both to B2B and B2C. Being less salesy and focusing on conversion and instead focusing more on the brand being part of the community and that everybody's dealing with some of those same problems. Hey, Scott, you know, just before you uh, continue on there, can I stop you and just ask you, you made a comment there about, you referenced about different parts of the funnel. Some of our audience may not uh, be familiar with that phrase. Can you explain it to us? Right. Sorry, sometimes as marketers, you know, we get stuck in our <laughs> jargon, right? Um, so the funnel is something that's a, you know, a traditional concept that's been used in sales where you often think about your customer acquisition as being the top of the funnel and conversion and the final sale and, and repeat purchase of those people at the bottom of the funnel. And naturally, you're going to have a lot more people that are potential clients than you are that are actual clients. So uh, I worked for a firm in the early 2000s and we designed a telemarketing campaign to, to get some more customers and we bought a list uh, with about 20,000 names on it and a first pass we, we filtered that name down to 15,000 names that might actually have an interest in our product and then we called those and we got maybe 10% of those names that were willing to actually meet with one of our salespeople and we converted about 10% of those, which was actually quite successful, but that's how your funnel sort of trickles in. In the digital space, we look at this within, if you have Google Analytics on your site, you can actually look at the traffic to your site, that's gonna be a large number, but those that actually convert and do certain actions on your site is gonna be a smaller number. And ultimately, you want to try to look at how you can more effectively move people through that funnel to conversion. So brands have been thinking about these funnels for a long time, but so often the metrics are really driven around the bottom of the funnel, right? Conversions. How do we justify digital marketing by showing how many sales we got? This is actually a great time to take a step back and think about the top of the funnel activity. So how do you build audiences? How do you create brand awareness for your brands? And those brands that sort of started to think that they're more engaged with supporting the community are those that are going to be more successful as they come out of this uh, particular instance. 
So we talked about this actually a, a couple of years ago. So this is my uh, shameless self-promotion um, and uh, maybe promotion for Haskain Hour. Uh, uh, so a couple of years ago, I did a talk with Scott Hughes from Critical Mass uh, as a Haskain Hour. And, and I've included the link here because if it's something you're interested in, I would suggest people might want to have a look. And we talked about this idea of being on the right side of the cultural moment. So how do you as a brand engage with your audience? And um, we really laid out these seven steps and highlighted that you need to think authentically. You need to think about what you represent as a brand and how you communicate that to your audience. So if that cause and purpose that you're engaged with is part of your DNA, then you're going to be more successful in that communication. And if you have that operationalized in what you do. So we've seen brands that have really struggled. For example, State Street Global Advisors, they created the, uh, the Fearless Girl statue, which stood in front of the, the bull in Wall Street to highlight more women on boards. And then you found out that as a firm, they actually had a very low representation of women in senior positions. And they had actually been um, uh, challenged about their lower pay for women. So it wasn't in their DNA and you can't deliver that message authentically if it's not part of who you are. Well, that's, uh, that's a great uh, point. I like that one. I didn't know that about uh, the bull. Yeah. But that's interesting. So for these points, raise your how to identify how you want to be on the right side of the cultural conversation with COVID. Can you think of someone then, uh, other than, you know, obviously they didn't do it right, but uh, the, an organization that has done it well? Yeah, I think, I mean, a lot of people have been talking about Nike as the gold standard in this case. And I mean, Nike always has an amazing, uh, amazing advertising program when they worked with Wyden and Kennedy and created uh, Just Do It. This was the ad that they posted. They got the messaging right. If you ever dreamed of playing for millions around the world, now is your trance. So they recognized that what we saw was a lot of people doing the same message, you know, insert uh, sad music here, insert we're all in this together, B-roll footage of an empty street. And all of these messages were quite, were quite similar from most brands. And instead, Nike thought about what they represented as a brand, um, how they could stay on message with what they were doing. Uh, so this is one, I think, this was a great example of that. Now, the interesting thing that's come out of this is that in the last two weeks, basketball shoes, shoes have had a 980% year over year uplift, uplift in sales. So I think uh, it probably hasn't hurt Nike to have that positive brand image uh, during this time. Uh, I was going to share a second one with you and I think I'm not sure if I shared my sound correctly. So uh, let's hope this works. Um, I think a lot of brands have also focused on the seriousness of the message. And I think that can cause problems with your authenticity as well. Because if you aren't a brand that seriousness is in your DNA, how do you make that shift? And this example from Burger King, I think was a fantastic example how they maintained their identity as a brand while at the same time um, uh, creating an appropriate advertising. Your country needs you to stay on your couch and order in. Do your part and we'll do ours. Order through the Burger King app and the delivery fees are on us. So staying home doesn't just make us all safer, it makes you a couch patriot. And to help healthcare heroes, we are donating Whopper sandwiches to nurses. And we are also proudly supporting the American Nurses Foundation. Stay home of the Whopper. I love that commercial. That is so funny. I just think it's, it strikes, you know, the right balance uh, between, uh, you know, the seriousness uh, of the situation in terms of giving donation, plus the humor and, and on the couch, come patriot as they call it. So I, I actually think, you know, right now, especially as all of us have been through this very serious time, that it that gives some levity and it speaks to us for a real feeling for that we need that right now. And I think it on that brand awareness when you talk about that and building your brand, it's a really great example of doing that. Even though right now that wasn't just a great sound bite, I think it gave us a feeling for how to do that on the ground building. So let's go on to your second lesson that you talk about, which is around content. Your country needs 
sorry, there we go. Okay, so content marketing is, um, you know, I think as we talked about is that people have realized that they are using online sources as a, as a way of, of learning more um, in this crisis and, and engaging through platforms and trying to develop new hobbies and do new things. And they're looking for brands to provide that to them. Whenever I talk about content, I like to go way back. Uh, and I think, you know, what is content marketing? A lot of people don't know why we look to a tire company to tell us about what restaurants are really good, right? Like Michelin stars are, the sort of the the pinnacle of restaurants and yet michelin is a tire company and this was an early example of content marketing which was where michelin wanted more people to drive so they created this guide with restaurants around france uh and reviews of these restaurants to encourage them to drive and then they would give these out at tire shops and gas stations and places where a car uh, people driving would go. Now, this is early content and content has grown immensely in the digital space. People are looking to find useful information that can help them in just like the Michelin Guide to Drivers. The key thing with a content strategy is that it, it has to be useful for consumers, but it also has to be appropriate and relevant to you as a brand, which this was. See, I didn't know that the Michelin guy arose from a tire company, and I didn't know it was that old, that edition being 1900. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of a hard time here, Scott, because this is a, uh, uh, a copy of, uh, this is a physical guide, and I thought we were talking about lessons on the digital side. So, uh, do you want to redeem yourself here and give us an equivalent of the Michelin guide on the digital side for us during COVID? Of course. There we so, go. Um, so there have been a few interesting examples during the lockdown. Uh, Fender guitars, for example, that people might know offered free lessons online. But I really like this one. This was Gymshark. So Gymshark is a clothing brand uh, that is for workout gear. It's, uh, it's tights, shorts, shirts, etc. But they actually have a whole set of influencers that they work with, personal trainers that buy their brand and promote their brand. And what they did was they provided a platform for these personal trainers to share workouts online. So, and they called it the hashtag home team. So this, they invited them to, sh to create these workouts and then they shared them through this, this uh, site. So really what we see with this example is that what we know about good content is that it is something that is relevant, which this was to people stuck at home. It was something people were looking for because it was, it was interesting to them and something they needed timely because they were stuck at home and ultimately it was something that they would find enjoyable and entertaining and if we can align good content that looks like this we're going to be better positioned for people to engage with our brand i also think that the burger king ad was uh, had good content too because i found it interesting entertaining relevant and timely i mean it might it's a bit time stamped because now we're not staying at home but I thought it was also a good example of good content. Um, so if we were going to go on this and go to your final lesson, which is the concept of personalization, uh, what is that as a marketing strategy for lesson number three? Yeah, so I think the important thing in the digital space is we have to recognize that a generic strategy is not going to work. Um, and we just need to look right now at what's happening in political conversations around COVID. Um, you know, simple, even innocuous items like wearing a face mask have become flashpoints around this, right? That, that we can't just look at a particular region or even a particular demographic group and assume that everybody's going to have the same perception. So if you were to create um, content or an ad around showing people wearing face masks, that might be a real flashpoint, a negative flashpoint for some people, while it might be positive for others. So what we have to really think about in personalization is how do you make sure you have the right message at the right time to the right audience? And, you know, this may be more difficult now than it was early in the lockdown. When Nike delivered their message, everybody was, well, everybody, the, the large, much larger uh, set of the population felt that the lockdown was important. Now we're seeing less of that. So how do you adjust that message going forward? Um, and so this is something that um, brands can very effectively use, do using data. So understanding how people approach your site, what they're searching for on your site, and data analytics becomes really crit critical here. So it's important that firms start thinking about using the mountains of data that we have 
um, more effectively. So retailers actually have a tremendous advantage here because they already have a lot of data. But things like Amazon recommendations or those Facebook ads you get that are similar to your, that are based on your browsing history are examples of personalization. And so brands are gonna be able to use this if they generate those insights about audiences and develop flexible content that, that adjusts to these audience and delivers appropriately to the audience. Now, one of, one of the recent examples that many people may be aware of was Target used this personalization. Um, uh, they actually followed the surfing behavior of people on their website. And based on the shopping behavior of this particular teenage girl, they determined that she was pregnant. And so they started sending her products that were, um, that were likely to be interesting to people that were pregnant. Started sending her ads for strollers and, uh, and particular types of vitamins and maybe even diapers. And her father was furious because he couldn't believe this brand would be sending these ads to this teenage girl about pregnancy. Well, it turned out she was pregnant and Target knew before her father knew because of the way they had gathered data on the site. Totally interesting about that. I don't know. I wonder what your father felt like. If, like, if that was a bit of a backlash, might not have worked out the same way that they wanted it to. Exactly. So you really you provided us with three lessons from a digital marketing perspective that are valuable. Uh, the one around brand content, the personalization. But how do you all of these small bets come together? Um, like how do firms align the, these activities? with their overall strategy. How is that done? You know, I think one of the things that we've really seen in this space is that you can't think of your e-commerce strategy as being independent of your face-to-face -face strategy. You have to think about how those things come together. So rather than thinking about multi-channel, increasingly firms in the digital space are saying, this is an omni-channel world. We need to be where consumers are and that we need to be thinking about how all those channels integrate with one another. And we've seen that, that people are ordering online and doing curbside drop off or maybe they're or curbside pickup, or maybe they're dropping into the store for something, or maybe they're getting something delivered. But all of those things need to work together so that if you order something, for example, on curbside, can you also then go in the store and pick something else up? Or can you have something delivered and something pick up? And so how all of these work together is critical and we need to think of them not in a silo. There's a great lesson in omni-channel marketing from Macy's. They've been one of the early success story, uh, stories. In the early 2010s, they, they introduced an omni-channel strategy and this chart actually shows Macy's profit margin relative to uh, Amazon in red, Walmart in blue and Target in white in terms of change in their profit margin. And over this uh, five-year period after they introduced this, they had a 200% increase in their profit margin. What Macy's did was they optimized their supply chain and they thought about how everything worked together. So consumers would order online and pick up in store. They would use a fast fail approach to try new things out, trying those little bets to see what worked and what wouldn't. And they removed purchasing silos, so they created a much more efficient supply. Macy's was ahead of the curve on this one, making those small bets, and we're ready for the digital infection point. The question is, how many other companies are ready, and are we ready to sort of move these bets forward? Well, that's great. Uh, great um, presentation and discussion around digital marketing. We're gonna go to Q&A. And um, a tent is going to take over from here. And while well, she's just getting up and running, if on the Q and A, she could just it's gone away. But uh, if you could raise your hand via the participants menu, then uh, Tanya will come on and call on you when it's your turn. But if you could please unmute your microphone at that time. And while Tanya's getting the question, everybody's lined up for the question. I have a quick question for you, Scott. You've provided us with lots of examples to demonstrate these three lessons. You've talked about Nike, Burger King, and Macy's, and all of them are ones where we need to see examples. And how would you do a B2B, for, uh, an example for B2B or one for a not-for-profit or government? Yeah. I just want to go yeah, I think I think these things these um, these tools are still really important in that space. So um, I were I was thinking about this and thinking that imagine uh, you're a uh, an oil field uh, service company, right? And one of the things you do is that you normally 
fly people up to do training. Can you move that into a digital space, right? So right now you might provide, you probably are providing some form of content already. You might have white papers or instruction manuals that you provide to your customers. The question is, can you move these digitally? Are we seeing the space where that content could be de delivered a different way? So can those manuals be made online and available at the time people need them instead of having to hunt you down for it? Could you think about maybe with Zoom now, could we do distance learning? And instead of flying someone out to train people on in situ, maybe now we've seen that what we can do is do, with Zoom is do this more electronically or more digitally. So all of these are examples where we think about what is the content that we provide to our customers and how can we de deliver that in a digital way? That's great. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. So again, just to reiterate, if anyone has a question, uh, if you go to the participants menu, uh, you'll have the option to raise your hand uh, and then we can call on you there. Or uh, alternatively, you're welcome to ask questions in the chat and, and uh, I can ask them of uh, Scott and Beth. Um, we do have a question uh, that came in that says, um, do you think those that have shifted to online purchases or using online media will continue to do so in the future if our current COVID situation becomes less severe? Yeah, I, th I, I mean, I don't think it's going to be to the level that it is right now, right? I mean, I, I think what we're seeing is we look forward at other markets. So in Asia and in Australia, and even in some areas of Europe, like Spain and Italy, which has started to open up, um, there's been a variation in how much of uh, a continuity there has been of the digital purchasing. Where we maybe had 20% of digital of purchasing for brick and mortar stores was online historically, I think we're going to see an increase. And most analysts are sort of saying maybe a bump of 20%, right? We might see a move up from where the baseline was about 20% that it may, may now move up to about 40%. And so that there's an expected increase. Honestly, I think that might be a bit conservative. I think a lot of people have realized how much they can do online. I think we might actually see a little bit more than that. But it also varies by country. The decline in Australia of online shopping has been much less than the decline in Asia and in Southern Europe. So it's going to vary a little bit by country and it remains to be seen what it will be in Canada. Um, however, I, I think we're going to see a pretty substantial uptick how much remains to be seen? I'm wondering, um, you know, Scott, um, there was a question that came to me from one of the audience members that would be good to talk about, which is, you know, this is a positive side for consumers. Um, is there risks involved? Okay, so I'm the lawyer and I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about the risk side as my technical background or as a board member, the risk side in terms of saying things that are wrong in digital marketing, like, is that risk bigger? Uh, you know, I would sort of say it might be on the reputational side than uh, other marketing plays. Love to hear your comments. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we actually talk about this a little bit in our director's education program on social media and the relevance to boards. You know, it's, uh, there's a lot of things that companies have often done privately um, that now there seems to be pressure to share those publicly, right? And there's much more of a pressure to share things immediately and quicker. So there's absolutely a risk that comes in social media in that space. Um, there's also risk associated with um, your individuals who are people that are members of the company, but also have a social media presence, for example. So at what point are they a representative of the company? And at what point are they acting on their own behalf? And given how widely those things are shared, there's, yeah, there's definitely risk in that space. Um, I think the target is another interesting example because there is a risk of that uh, around privacy, right? And are we getting into a little bit of a kind of creepiness space, right? Is that firms have a lot more information about you than maybe you want them to have? And how much information do we give up to firms? And how much are we comfortable giving up? I like those recommendations on Amazon, but for Amazon to give me those recommendations, it means they've got to know quite a bit about me if those are going to be effective. And so the question is, how much am I willing to give up in that space? So I think how firms respond to that. Now Target, I, so I gave the Target example, the way they've responded is they've actually tempered 
the way they send offers now. So now if somebody is pregnant, for example, they'll send them one uh, ad or one promotion for a pregnancy related item, then they'll send them two or three generic ones. So it doesn't appear as much that they are targeting. Um, but again, that feels a little manipulative. So I, th I think there's definitely some ethics, ethic issues around security and privacy, as well as the risks of uh, the social risks of how people communicate. Yeah, and, and from the uh, side of, if I was um, giving advice on uh, to a client on the risk side here going forward, especially in COVID, I would, I think that it's, you know, your, I think your comments are so prudent because you talk about saying taking smaller little bets along the way rather than taking a very big bet. And uh, there'll be those that rush to do that. And I think that's um, really good advice to go forward through the COVID phase because digital marketing will become more prevalent for sure. Great. Uh, so Ted has his hand raised here. So uh, I'll call on him if you want to go next. Uh, just unmute yourself and go ahead. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Chuck. Great talk. Uh, just want to ask about whether you see any difference in the digital marketing space in terms of focus on local brands as opposed to national, or are there examples where you know, large multinationals, but uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of uh, support for the community and local businesses, and if you have any sort of thoughts or statistics around how that might transpire post-COVID? Yeah, you know, that's that's a great question, Ted, because I mean, sure, I gave examples of Target and Nike. I mean, these are big brands with big big marketing budgets, right? And and they have, uh, they have a lot of opportunity to be able to continue to invest their advertising dollars in this way. Uh, and, and the, the question, question is, how do we continue, continue to invest those marketing dollars? Um, one of the things we've seen, uh, anytime we have a rollback or a recession or challenges, is that firms that don't continue to uh, invest in marketing actually do struggle to, to bounce out of it. So I think it's important for those small firms to continue to invest where they can in marketing. Um, but I think one of the nice things about digital is that you can do this in a, in a very cost-effective way. A lot of times it's about time and effort rather than necessarily cost to be very effective. And you know, I was thinking about a small example, so I actually have one up. So this is, uh, this is good timing. I'm gonna share with you, this is a company, uh, let me just share my screen here. This is a company called Jenny's Ice Cream, uh, which is a small um, ice cream company. Uh, and uh, this was a social media post that they shared early on in COVID and really highlighted, I think it was really genuine and really authentic and effectively cost them nothing. So I think maintaining that connection with your community, showing that you can engage with them, is uh, even small firms to can do that. And thinking about what is the content that you deliver, I think you can do that as well. There's no reason they couldn't provide ice cream recipes for how to use, uh, how to create an ice cream sandwich at home or how to create a great sundae or things like that. Very inexpensive that even a local firm uh, could, could execute on. I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, we have quite a few questions that have come through the chat. So how do you balance privacy issues versus the invasion of some of these companies? And how does someone control the data mining being done to them? Mm, yeah, I mean, this is, this is a really interesting question because we sort of have to, we have to decide as a consumer and take ownership of our, of our information and decide what we want to release and what we don't want to release. Um, and that's hard to do. Uh, generally, the governments have been uh, providing oversight and requiring that of most firms. So if you are willing to dig into the, into the details in Facebook, you can actually decide what is shared and what isn't shared. I think the real challenge is, is that we often don't know what we're sharing. Uh, I, uh, I'm an avid snowboarder and uh, I was in line at the hill this winter and I saw this brand of snowboard clothes that I hadn't seen before. It was called Montec. I thought, wow, that's really nice. I like the style of it. I like the look of it. I pointed it out to my wife, but I didn't say the name of the brand. That evening at home, I was on Facebook and I got pushed an ad for Montec. So I'm wondering how they knew, right? Why did I'd never seen the brand before? And so whether they I maybe have the proximity turned on on my phone so they knew that I was next to somebody who was wearing this product 
or whether I did say something without realizing it and my phone was picking that up. So we very often have to balance our convenience with our privacy. So if you have your phone turned on or you have an Alexa at home where you just say, hey Alexa, then you've left it on all the time. And you've done that for convenience, but you're trading it off for privacy. So I think there's ownership on both sides. I think as consumers, we have to take some ownership of our privacy and our data, but I think we also need to hold firms to a high standard and expect that they are gonna treat our data uh, securely and privately. So I, I, think, I think those two come together. Also, Scott, if I was gonna give a comment back on sort of the legal, sort of regulatory public policy side, but this is something that government really has to get a handle on. We've been talking about, you know, Amazon, how big uh, some of the data mining is and, uh, you know, who's going to control that. That is something that's, it's, it's not a, just a Canadian issue. If that's the size of Amazon, et cetera, and Google, um, you know, how, how are we going to manage that within our global world as to who can has that content and it's actually those decisions I think are being made right now without anyone really thinking about it. Yeah yeah and I mean the, we talk about the sort of five V's of, of data analytics and big data they often talk about the velocity uh, and the volume right those are two of the sort of the V elements and I think people don't always realize how what we're talking about with big data is that linked data, right? It's the fact that you get massive data from Facebook, but if Facebook data is also linked to Google data and is linked to scanner data that's tied to your loyalty card, and that's linked to maybe GPS data from your phone, that is an awful lot of information that people have about you. And I think in a lot of cases, we don't know the full volume of that information. And it's moving at such a fast pace that it's hard for governments and regulators to keep up. Well, and how do you possibly think about regulating that within, because it crosses all kinds of boundaries, borders, like, you know, it's not Canada, it's not U.S., et cetera. So it will be something that uh, the next gen will have to deal with. So I think as a marketer, what my advice would be, would be to think of marketing as the term we often use is permission marketing right? So thinking about that you are distributing content, you are providing messages to firms that have given you permission to provide that message to you. Um, and so that's important is that if they say they want to unsubscribe, you unsubscribe them, right? If, if you ask for information, make sure that information, that there's a value that you're returning on that information and that you are getting their permission, otherwise you're spamming them. In preparing for this uh, talk, I read a couple ad articles on Ad Age, and they actually somehow it got in my notification center, and it's driving me nuts because I've actually gotten three notifications from Ad Age while I've been doing this session, and I can't figure out how to turn it off. That to me is not permission marketing. Yeah, I, and I think that will become uh, more key, especially as on the legal side going forward. I'm like, I like hearing you say that because if we do that, then it will be a better experience for all of us. We have to remember that we're all consumers here. Great, so the next question is, what do you think the roles we media, video clips in particular, will play in digital marketing? Uh, I mean, that's, that I think is the beauty here, is that, is that um, creating that media is something where this is this transition to digital that we're seeing here, right? Is it at one time, you created a, uh, a manual, right? Uh, a physical manual to do things. So um, I've talked about being a snowboarder. I'm also a mountain biker and I like to repair my own bikes. And so there's a classic Zen in the art of my mountain bike maintenance, which is the big Bible on how to fix your bike. I don't go to the book anymore. I go find the video online. I go to park tools. I go to people that show me how to do it and I can watch it. And so increasingly I gain a lot of value from those brands that are willing to provide me information that I can be empowered on my own. So I think video in the workout example I gave with Gymshark, you know, fixing your own car or your own bike, um, learning tools on how to ride or how to do different things is a space that increasingly, if brands can provide that to their customers, then they're gonna see the value and remember and come back to that brand. So, but again, do things that are relevant to you as a brand. That content needs to be relevant to you. So I think in the COVID world, 
you don't know, there's no brand that needs to be the one-stop shop for all things COVID. You want to be the place where they find information that's relevant to you as a brand. So as you design video, as you design other content, think about how it aligns with what you as a brand stand for. Great. Uh, the next one is, what should, these com what should those companies that have pivoted to online sales do to sustain that business in anticipation of a return to the old normal mm. in a post-pandemic environment? Yeah, I mean, I guess that maybe some clarity on that question might be a bit helpful because there are, you know, have firms pivoted entirely and abandoned some of their physical location? Because there are brands that we're seeing in a work uh, sense that Twitter is closing their physical locations and they're moving to online. So if they've shuttered their store and let their lease go and they no longer have a physical location, then that's a little bit different than if you've been sort of making do uh, and still maintaining both. Um, and I think that's gonna have a, a, an impact on the choices that you made coming out of this. But ultimately I think maintain as much of the online as you can. Uh, if, if it's efficient, if it's been effective, if it's been able to deliver what you need to deliver as a brand, how can you leverage to continue that? Just because the general market might dip back down to 20 or 40%, that doesn't mean that you as a brand couldn't stay at 80% if that makes most sense for you and that works for your customers. Hey, the next one is you, mess, you mentioned that authenticity is important. Mm. Do you feel that paid posts on LinkedIn and Instagram take away from authenticity because these kinds of posts may be perceived as salesy? Mm. It seems that to get better exposure tr slash traction from some articles um, or some articles indicate that paid posts are the way to go. Yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're focusing on the bottom of the funnel, then paid can be very effective. So I'm not, I, I guess I'm, I'm not suggesting that we abandon the bottom of the funnel. I think we're still going to have to think about conversion. I think in terms of the language around COVID, there needed to be a little less of the salesy push. And I think some of that is going to come back, but we don't want to abandon thinking about the top of the funnel when we start working more on conversion. So thinking about your paid uh, placements, either through LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever those paid are, if they're on websites, whatever the sort of the, the server is, however they're delivering them on your behalf, um, think about what you're trying to accomplish with those, right? So if you're thinking about an awareness, you can do a paid campaign that could be around awareness and the messaging will be around awareness. Maybe it's about delivering content, maybe it's about, um, uh, about uh, sort of creating brand awareness or, or linking to influencers in your network. Or you may have paid placement that's about act now 20% off. And depending on what you're trying to accomplish with that paid placement, um, you may have a mix of those things. If your message is personalized and it's personalized at the right point, it will seem and it will be more authentic because the people that are looking for information and more general won't get the sales push message. But those that have, say, a shopping cart that they've abandoned, they may need the, the, that little push, right? They, that may be the place where you send a personalized message to move them over that hurdle of making the purchase. Great, so I think we have time for one last question. So I'll uh, ask this one. If we think about the protests occurring in the US at the moment, often brands feel the need to weigh in on the situation, but that can sometimes backfire. How can brands do so authentically? Yeah, I mean, and that's, uh, I mean, for those that are interested in that, I would, I would direct you back to the Haskane Hour. Um, when we did that two years ago, we were shortly after uh, Black Lives Matter was really a sort of strong hashtag, and we'd seen some instances of that. Um, at that point, we actually saw Pepsi was an absolute disaster with how they responded to uh, Black Lives Matter. With They created the Kendall Jenner ad, and they tried to position themselves in the middle of this conversation. And it was a brand that at the time, I didn't feel had any reason to be there. If you looked at their mission, they were a consumer products good company. They were about selling product, and they really didn't align with that. I think at the time, Coke may have been better at positioning themselves in this conversation because it's been more embedded in who they are as a brand, right? For years, Coke has been, I'd like to buy the world of Coke, right? And 
to teach it to sing in perfect harmony. So, you know, racial unity has been something that has been part of Coke's conversation for years. So because it's embedded in their DNA, they may be better positioned to, to respond to that. Um, so I think, I think you need to embed it in who you are as an organization, and then you can enter the conversation, but you've got to pick the right way to enter the conversation. Uh, one of my colleagues shared an example uh, just the other day that the Edmonton Eskimos, for example, entered this conversation about equity, diversity, and inclusion, and people responded and said, you maybe need to change your name before you start entering this conversation. It's hard when you have a name that is inappropriate, dated, uh, and not aligned with our, our view of Indigenous people, it's hard for you to enter that conversation when you haven't gotten your own house in order. So I think to enter the cultural conversation, that DNA part is critical, and you need to look for the opening. So, um, I, you know what, I, Tanya, if you don't mind, there was one that came up that I think is really important for a last question, Scott, to put you on the, um, on the right in front of everybody around this issue on oil and gas, a question came up for specifically about any example you would have for the digital marketing on oil and gas services, especially in the COVID environment, because as you know, oil and gas is a central part of our, um, of our, of our Calgary's fabric. And um, right now it would be good for us to have a bit of a voice. And what does that voice look like from a digital marketing side? Yeah, and I think, I think we need to, I, I often get a lot of uh, oil and gas uh, uh, directors and executives in my executive MBA class, and we often talk about this challenge of, of how do we think about oil and gas? And, and very often, oil and gas firms tend to think of themselves as existing in um, their direct channel. They think about that they are selling to the next person down the channel, and they don't always think about how they fit within the broader uh, energy space, right? So they're often... Extraction companies are thinking about how the midstream are their, their customer, not necessarily thinking that the end consumers are also your customer, because ultimately that midstream has to go there. So I think um, one, one suggestion would be to think of your market more broadly. Think of yourself not as an oil and gas company, but that you are an energy company and that you're delivering um, that service and that benefit to a broader audience and thinking of it longer term. I think when you start to do that, then you start thinking about the resources that maybe you can provide that may be of value. So those resources may be some that are direct resources to your immediate channel partners. So I mentioned earlier, you could do things like online training, you can provide manuals, you can provide white papers, you can provide specs on your product, many things you're probably already doing. But do you also have messaging or information that may be valuable to people further down the stream? Right? Is there information about environment, if environmental and sustainability is a challenge that, that you're facing, is there information you can provide about that and what you do as an organization? Uh, can you provide glimpses and video into your practices and how responsible you are with those practices so that it can counter some of the perceptions of dirty oil or, or the negative perceptions around the industry when we know this is an industry that is engaged fully in efficient practices, in recycling water and things like that. How do we share that and pivot that conversation? And I think using content and using messages in that way may be one tool that the industry could use to sort of further um, improve the awareness and the perception of the industry at this time. That's a great opportunity, um, actually, that, that digital marketing might actually present us with an opportunity that we wouldn't regularly have in the oil gas sector to reach out because it personalizes it. Okay, so I think we're wrapped up, unless there's any other questions. Tanya, do we have any other questions? No, I think good. Yeah. That's it. Okay, well, I just want to say so. thank you so much, Scott. What a great presentation, really thoughtful, and not an area that I am involved in, uh, but I think that everybody will be going forward. I think it is an inflection point for all of us, and that there's great lessons that we learned from here. Those three lessons you talked about on the brand, the content, and the personalization, if that we were going to take away those three. And um, also, I just want to say thank you also, besides saying thank you to Scott, to our audience for being with us today. 
and to the great um, um, Haskeen executive team, Tanya, Patrick, Lauren, uh, Janelle. Um, thank you all so very much for putting in all your extra hard work on these sessions. And a reminder that our Haskeen Connects is on next week, uh, June 10th, on the topic of, this is a great topic because we're all, all being we all are being kept up at night thinking about things, but it's what is keeping senior leaders, leaders up at night? And it's a moderated panel discussion with Lauren Falkenberg and some directors from some of the companies, Marilyn Schonenberger, Patricia McLeod, and myself. So thanks, everyone. Thank you.